Shalom. Welcome to Light to the Nations. Chag Urim Sameach. Happy Hanukkah. Festival of Lights is upon us. Such a beloved holiday. It's time to eat potato pancakes and spin the dreidel. And of course, to light the Hanukkah lights, the Hanukkah candles. Hanukkah is such a beloved time. Everybody lights Hanukkah candles. And we find a reflection of this idea in Jewish law that it's such a precious commandment and it's so important for it to be fulfilled that we have an expression about being extra stringent with the fulfillment of lighting the Hanukkah lights. Even a, a person who is impoverished is obligated to get his act together, to sell something, to borrow money if he has to, to fulfill the commandment of lighting the Hanukkah lights something very deeply instilled within every Jewish heart. You know, it's not a secret that without the Holy Temple in our midst, everything is different. It's something that we certainly are focused on all year round. All the Jewish holidays, the festival pilgrimages, everything is centered around the Holy Temple. And our lives without it are totally muted and uh, we are living in some sort of illusory world, illusory reality, without the vibrancy of the Holy Temple. Of course, the concept of Hanukkah is all about the rededication of the Holy Temple, a certain period of time, in the time of the Second Temple, when the land of Israel was invaded by foreign elements, by the Greeks, and the Temple was rendered impure, the, the thrust of this invasion was indeed focused on uprooting Jewish observance. It was, a, it was a war, a campaign against the character and the identity of Torah and the presence of Hashem being felt in this land. And the miracle of Hanukkah, both the concept of the oil that was found, the one cruise of oil that was found to be intact and pure with the seal, bearing the seal of the high priest, as well as the military victory. These two ideas, they're all about gaining um, control of the land of Israel and first and foremost reinstating the service of the Holy Temple. So you know that there are many commandments in the Torah um, that can't be fulfilled the same way without the Holy Temple. There's no secret. Everything has become, many things have become quite watered down without the Holy Temple. And those that really emphasize the centrality of the Holy Temple and try to feel something in their lives and teach and educate and, and um, are active about the Holy Temple, it's all because the, 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 the idea here really is that our very substance as Jews, our, our connection to Hashem, our task in the world, our claim to our legacy, we can't really fulfill it without the Holy Temple. And many commandments that we fulfill are not, we're not able to fulfill them the same way. Take a famous example, the Passover Seder. The Passover Seder, as we, as we do it today, it's very beautiful and it's very um, moving and of course we still have the aspect of, of the evening of the night of the exodus from Egypt, that aspect pertaining to the biblical commandment of a father telling over to his child the story of the exodus. We can fulfill that um, and we can stay up the whole night talking about the miracle of the exodus, but you're supposed to do that in the presence of the Passover offering on the table the matzah that we can still eat on Pesach, we're supposed to eat it with the Passover offering. So the Passover Seder is really a shadow of itself. It is a remembrance of Passover in the time of the Holy Temple. And then, of course, there are things that we do all throughout the year that are a zecher, that are a remembrance for the Holy Temple. Everybody knows about the glass that the, that the groom breaks under the chuppah. Everyone knows that there are other customs. For example, a person has a home, they're supposed to leave a cubit on the wall opposite the entrance to their home, unfinished, unpainted or unpapered, kind of as a 
remembers to the fact that, the, that Hashem's house is not complete, so how could our house be complete? So there are things that we do that are all about the fact that we try never to, to have a disconnect in our consciousness that things are not right here without the Holy Temple. And then there are some things that we can do the way they're supposed to be done. And Hanukkah is kind of um, between two worlds, in my mind, <clears throat> in, this, in this regard. You know, we want to do the mitzvot as best as possible, like they were in the time of the temple. And everything that we do in our lives with our sometimes, it seems, obsessive emphasis on the central role that the Holy Temple plays, it's all because the Torah teaches us very, very emphatically and very clearly that everything centers on the consciousness that pervades our people and the world when Hashem's presence dwells in our midst in the Holy Temple. And Hanukkah is really all about the return of that, of that presence to the Holy Temple. But there seems to have developed in the course of our exile, in the course of the whole experience of our wandering and our resettlement in, in this land and everything that happened in between in the diaspora communities, there seems to have um, been supplanted in our minds, in our collective consciousness, some sort of dichotomy about our Torah observance. And I'd like to best sum this up in the words of the great American poet Wallace Stevens. I really like Wallace Stevens' work. In 1954, Wallace Stevens wrote a poem, and the poem is called, Not Ideas About the Thing, But the Thing Itself. Capital T. Look it up. You could pause right now and look it up simultaneously with the technology of our world. Wallace Stevens, not ideas about the thing, but the thing itself. He was really trying to express his feeling, his goal in what he was trying to develop, his particular art of poetry. His whole idea about poetry is that he wanted the poem to become not an imitation of life, but the life itself. He wanted it to be such a direct uh, reflection of reality that it didn't suffice for him for the poem just to be expressing um, an idea, but for it somehow to, to um, transpose and be the thing itself, exactly. Not ideas about the thing, but the thing itself. So too, when we come to fulfill the mitzvot of the Torah, so much in the great literature of our sages and in the, in the mindset of, of, of our people throughout the generations, so much has been reduced to pure symbolism and nothing more. And I understand this, I understand how this situation came about because in the, in the process of the uprooting and the trauma of leaving our land and in the process of the exile, We've been bereft of a, of a great portion of what we're really able to do as Jews. But some things we still, we still can do the same. But about this dichotomy, you know, parts of the temple service, the incense service, the ketorets, the offerings in the temple, the Passover offering that we mentioned, we have a tradition that even though we are not, we're not able to fulfill these commandments, we're still able to affect something of the cosmic rectification of, this, of these services by the recitation of the verses. This is a time-honored concept. It's a very holy concept. It's a very solid concept, the Holy Zohar, which of course we regard with absolute reverence, talks about how in lieu of the Holy Temple by by reciting with great devotion and great concentration the service of the keturit, of the, of the incense in the morning, and by reciting the verses pertaining to the service of the daily offerings, to whatever extent possible, we are effecting a rectification 
similar to that that would be affected in the spiritual realm by actually bringing the offering. One could look at that and say, well, it's second best and it's kind of sour grapes and of course that consciousness and that position developed but it was only a result of the exile and were it not for the fact that the temple was destroyed we wouldn't have to have this kind of like alternative thinking but the truth is it's not so simple because there's even verses that make it clear that this is Hashem's intention so this isn't some sort of rabbinical uh, Judaism um, um, interpolation or addition Hashem made it quite clear that our prayers can have this effect. There is a, a, a verse in the book of Hosea, makes it very clear. It's actually in Hosea chapter 14 and verse 3 that states, take words with you and return to Hashem. Say to Him, may you forgive all iniquity and accept good intentions and let our lips substitute for bulls. This is actually the verse of the Holy Torah itself. Unashalma farim sfateinu. May our lips meaning the words of our lips, substitute for bulls. So there's a, an idea expressed by the Torah itself that our words can fill in, as it were, for the service of the temple in the meantime. But this dichotomy is, is very compelling to understand because when it comes to the, the mitzvah of Hanukkah, which is now upon us, the precious, beloved time of placing the lights of Hanukkah in a place where everyone can see them. Jewish law calls for these lights to be placed outside the home. Throughout the years and throughout all of the upheavals of Jewish history and recurrences of anti-Semitism, uh, tradition was developed for the, for the lights to be placed inside, near the entrance, in a central place where the whole family can see them. In, in the case of anti-Semitism, but the lights are supposed to be placed outside. And the sources are very, are very descriptive about what we accomplish when we light these lights. No wonder that Jewish people are so motivated, and even those that may be far from organized religion, a phrase that I hate to use, they'll, they'll, they'll always come back and light Hanukkah candles. Even those that feel not much of a connection to Jewish identity. They're, they feel very, very motivated to light the Hanukkah lights. Our sages tell us that when we light these lights, we are releasing into the world what's called the Or Haganuz, the hidden light of creation, which God originally brought into the world at the time of the six days of creation, but that only lasted for 36 hours from the time that he brought it into the world until the time that Adam was banished from the Garden of Eden that Adam actually enjoyed this light for 36 hours and that afterwards God hid it and it's called the Or Haganuz, the hidden lights, which will be revealed in the future in the time of the ultimate rectified world. But the 36 flames which we will be lighting over the entire festival of Hanukkah are considered to be a, a flash, a, a sparkling of those original 36 hours of the hidden light. It's a taste of the future rectified world. It's a taste of the original light of the Holy Golden Menorah that Aaron, that Aaron HaKohen, Aaron the High Priest, lit in the Holy Temple. And while Kabbalistically we do find such an idea that the light of Shabbat is also a reflection of the Or Haganuz, of the, of the light of the hidden world, by no other festival or by no other occasion on the calendar do we ever find any sort of reference that would be so bold as to say that this is a reflection of the Or Haganuz only on, Ch on Hanukkah and the Holy Shabbat itself, and there is a connection between the two. So we have this mitzvah of the Hanukkah lights, which everybody loves. It's in everybody's heart, very, very deeply rooted. And Hanukkah comes out at the darkest time of the year, in the darkest hour of the year. This month, shortest days, shortest daylight of the whole year. That's also part of this entire symbolic package that we light this light. And we light this light traditionally outside the home. And we light it on the left-hand side, on the, on the other side of the mezuzah. And we light it a certain height. And it has to be 
uh, not too high, not higher than 20 amot. It has to be fairly low, not too low. And all of this is extremely powerful in the writings of our sages based on the deepest secrets of the Torah about what we're accomplishing when we light the Hanukkah lights. And I believe that intuitively every Jew must feel this so strongly. And that's why we're so drawn to light these lights because we are literally fighting against forces of darkness when we light these, these lights. We place them outside the home and we place them on the left-hand side. We place them in the darkness and they shine forth. And the whole thing, getting back to that dichotomy and my issue that I feel Wallace Stevens is really rising to the occasion and addressing, you can look at it and read and study this holy Torah <coughs> of our sages and, and learn about the deep symbolic significance of the lights of, of Hanukkah and think that all we're doing with the Hanukkah lights, like in so many other instances when we've been reduced to a shell of our former selves and we're existing on a skeletal level until we, re we get the temple back, until we build it, you can think that all we're doing with these Hanukkah candles is that we're doing something very, very beautiful on a symbolic level. And I don't want you to make that mistake. That would be a terrible mistake because there's a very big difference, and this is my point today, that I want you to take into this beautiful, joyous festival of Hanukkah. There's a very big difference between Hanukkah and those other examples. Yes, this, this symbolism is so rich, rich and it's so real at the same time. What we're accomplishing on the spiritual realm by lighting these lights, but there's a very big difference. It's actually happening again. When we light the Hanukkah candles, it's very, very real. It's not only existing on the symbolic level, because with Hanukkah, we are actually bringing that same light and, that, and affecting that same tikkun in the world as did our forefathers, the Kohanim of the time of the Beit HaMikdash, the family of, of Matityahu in the time of the Holy Temple. Why is it that when it comes to Hanukkah specifically, we are taught that literally a reflection crystals of this Or Haganuz, of this hidden light, is released into the world. What are we being taught here? The Or Haganuz is released by true and purely motivated Jewish heroism. heroism. That's what the story of Hanukkah is all about. You know, it's so amazing that Hanukkah is an emphasis on the home. It's all about the temple, which is Hashem's home. It's all about the rededication of the altar in the Holy Temple. That's what the name Hanukkah comes from, from the rededication of the altar. Everything is all around the service of the Holy Temple, which had been wrested from the Jewish people and had been sullied and had been, and had been rendered impure. But with all the other festivals, the emphasis is not on the house. When it comes to Pesach, you have to leave your home and go up to Yerushalayim to celebrate Passover. When it comes to Sukkot, you can't be in the house at all. You have to build your sukkah outside the house. But when it comes to Hanukkah, the Hanukkah lights are to be placed outside the entrance to the home. And the Hanukkah lights are a memorial for the lights of the Holy Temple that were rekindled. You have to have a home in order to place it outside the entrance to the home. And you place them in that engulfing darkness that still tries to take over and still tries to diminish the light of the Holy Temple. And placing the lights outside the home is a statement. The statement is, and it's not only our home, it's about the Holy Temple as well. It's where the collective Jewish consciousness and heart is saying, this is my home. This is Hashem's home. You can't come in. What would have happened if the Kohanim would have said, you know what? We can't do this. They were, as we say in the holiday prayer, only a few at the hands of many what would happen if they would have said, this is too much for us, this is not something that we're going to be able to accomplish. It, it was a tremendous act of self-sacrifice and dedication and pure heroism over the course of many years that it took to battle this enemy and to repulse them from the land of Israel and to take back the land and to purify the temple and to reinstate the service. 
And this is the basis of the hidden light. And, you know, the first mobilization or usage of mass media, I think that our sages record, was during the story of Hanukkah, where we are taught in the Midrash that the Greeks instructed the Jews to write on a ram's horn the words, we have no portion in the God of Israel. The battle of Greece against Israel was not a physical battle. Many Jews died, many hundreds of thousands, in the course of the battles that ensued over the years. But the, but the decrees of Greece were all about the spiritual observance of Israel, and their decrees were against circumcision and against keeping the Sabbath and against, first and foremost, studying the Torah. And these decrees are referred to by our sages as darkness, the darkness that came upon the earth at that time. <coughs> and, this, and this psychological warfare that they employed and this man mantra that they made Israel repeat and even write on the, on, the, on the horn of a ram, we have no portion in the God of Israel. This was to be their undoing. Just as today we hear from our so-called peace partners touted and parroted and repeated by the world, we won't recognize Israel as being a Jewish state. You have no right to build in the land of Israel. Not only the Temple Mount, but the Kotel is not yours. It's not Jewish. This is a repetition in our time of rights on the horn of Aram. We have no portion in the God of Israel. This is the same force of darkness that is attempting to wrest Israel from its land, attempting to drive a wedge, a klipa, of darkness between Israel and her God. And so the whole concept of Hanukkah, which is so beautiful on the symbolic level, is so real at the same time and so true and not subject to that template, that pattern of the dichotomy that has entered into Jewish observance as a result of the exile. Because when you light the Hanukkah candles, you are calling forth the spirit of bravery and living for and by and with the Torah and Hashem at every moment. The light that we light at the entrance to our home reminds us that it is our job in this world to rekindle the hidden lights and to stand at the entrance to our home and to Hashem's home and say, you forces in the world, you cannot come in here. You have no entrance here. And to stand up and bring that light into the world and to be a reflection of the divine purpose. That's why Hanukkah is so beautiful and so beloved and why it's a, it's a reflection every year of the divine hidden or Haganuz, the hidden light because it's coming from the deepest place of the Jewish heart that is willing to take a stand for everything that's right, for the light of the world, which is the light of the temple, which is the light of Hashem, and to say, no matter what forces we were up against then, and no matter what forces we are up against now, we will not allow those for forces of darkness to enter into our home, into Hashem's home, into the land, but we will stand like a guardian at the entrance. So this is not an idea about the hidden light, not an idea about the thing. This is the hidden light itself that we have the privilege and the merit and the obligation of rekindling during this beautiful festival of Hanukkah. Light to the Nations is produced by the Temple Institute in the Marty Morrill Studios in Jerusalem, Israel. Dedications can be made for upcoming Light to the Nations teachings. To make a dedication, please visit templeinstitute.org, go to the multimedia section, and click on Light to the Nations. Or you can email media at templeinstitute.org. Your dedication.